Good morning, everyone. Dr. Ma, when you're ready, let me know. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Susan Lautenbach. I'm one of the volunteers here today for Epilepsy Awareness Day at Disney. And thank you so much for all logging in this morning to listen to Dr. Brandy Ma. She's an adult epileptologist trained at the University of California, San Francisco, and currently practicing at Houston Methodist Hospital in Houston, Texas. Uh, with a special interest in caring for women with epilepsy. I will be monitoring the chat for any questions you might have. And um, at the end, Dr. Ma, maybe we can have a, a Q&A session and, and maybe address some of the questions. So please use your chat. And without further ado, Dr. Ma, it's all yours. Just try and share my screen. I think you've disabled it. Susan, can you see if um, you can let me share my screen? That was not supposed to happen. I apologize for that. No worries. Um, there you go. Should be able to do it. There you go. We're all learning. <laughs> <laughs> Six months on Twitter, we're still learning. <laughs> no, right? right? Let's see if I can get it to work from my side. There you go. Perfect. Oops. I think I have it backwards, huh? No, it was fine. Could you see the slide or the presenter view? I could see the slide. Perfectly. The slide? Okay, let me try that one more time, guys. Sorry. All right, are we good? We're good. All right. Thank you, everyone, um, for joining us today, and thank you uh, for inviting me to talk with you. Uh, my name is Dr. Brandy Ma. I am an adult epileptologist uh, over at Houston Methodist Hospital at our Comprehensive Epilepsy Center here. Uh, my contact information is down below, so if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, contact me. All right, so today our topic is women treating women. So, you know, in general, when people have seizures, they are lumped together, women and men all together, um, you know, in terms of thinking about medications and choosing a, a doctor, but women are a special category. You know, we are special uh, for a lot of reasons. Things like our hormones impact our seizures. We have to think about birth control, pregnancy, breastfeeding, menopause, bone health. There's so many things that are special to us. And I just wanted to highlight a few of those today. So here's the outline for today's talk. We're gonna start a little bit about the hormonal effects on seizures and what we call catamenial epilepsy. We're gonna talk a little bit about contraception and its relationship with seizure medications. We'll move on to everything about pregnancy. So pregnancy planning, pregnancy, breastfeeding, postpartum issues. And then we'll talk a little bit about mood disorders relating to epilepsy and then about women's health and aging. So let's start a little bit with our hormones. So catamenial epilepsy, what is catamenial epilepsy? So about a third of women will experience changes in their seizure frequency in relation to our menstrual cycle. So in broad terms, our estrogen is thought to be pro-convulsant or potentially triggering seizures and progesterone is considered an anti-convulsant. So this graph, this little diagram on the right side is a little bit busy, but the things that I want you to notice are these lines here. So this orange line is our estrogen as we move through our menstrual cycle. And then the dotted purple line is the progesterone, okay? 
and here over here at 28 days is when we start menstruating and then around 14 days is when we start ovulating. So sometimes people will have worsening of their seizures around menstruation, so around 28 days, and this is thought to be due to this rapid drop in the progesterone. So this purple line you see is coming super fast down around 28 days, and that's when some people do have an increase in their seizures. Another time point that other women may have an increase in their seizures is when they are ovulating. So when there's a rapid increase in this orange line or their estrogen. Over and then some other women, so there's another pattern of catamenal epilepsy in women who may not ovulate um, regularly or they may not produce enough, enough progesterone. And these women sometimes will just have an increase in their seizure frequency across this entire second half uh, of their menstrual cycle. And so oftentimes when women start to feel like they have this you know, periodic increase in their seizures, we often tell them to keep a seizure diary, really mark out their, um, their cycle, and then when their seizures are occurring to see if it really is something that we call catamenial epilepsy. So currently, you know, there are no clear recommendations for treatment of catamenial epilepsy, but there are a few potential treatments that have helped people. And there are things that um, you can consider with your doctor. So one thing is supplemental progesterone. So some studies do show that people who have perimenstrual or around their menstru uh, menstruation time, seizure exacerbations could um, benefit from a little bit of extra progesterone. And this can be in the form of ever, either the Depo shot, the Depo Provera, which is um, injecting progesterone every three months. Um, or they can do it through oral medroxyprogesterone or progesterone lozenge. Another treatment is acetazolamide. So acetazolamide has been, you know, the oldest treatment around. Um, again, there's no clear evidence behind using it, but it has been shown to be helpful in some people. And in some situations, uh, additional seizure medications could potentially be scheduled around the time of menstruation in those who clearly have clustering of their seizures. So these seizure medications are usually in the form of either benzodiazepines like uh, clonazepam or uh, clobazam, which is the uh, longer acting daily seizure medication. So moving on to contraception and its relationship with seizure medications. So why is contraception important for all women with epilepsy of childbearing age? So most pregnancies are unplanned. About 45% in women uh, without epilepsy have unplanned pregnancies. And this is significantly higher in women with epilepsy. So there is an epilepsy birth control registry that actually shows almost 80% of women with epilepsy had an unintended pregnancy, 80%. And this may be due to an increased risk due to the types of birth control and seizure medications that we use because many forms of birth control are actually uh, not as effective when used in combination with our seizure medications. You can see here the oral contraceptive failure rate, so OCPs, the pill that we take every month, uh, every day, 1% um, failure rate in healthy women, but about 5% in women with epilepsy, so five times higher in women with epilepsy. So again, many of our seizure medications can increase the risk of fetal malformations, and thus it's very, very important to have that conversation with your doctor and to initiate contraception before uh, you plan on becoming sexually active. So the different types of contraception. So an intrauterine device, or an IUD, is the preferred method of contraception. So that's this uh, little picture right here. So many seizure medications can decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptive pills or OCPs by affecting their estrogen and or progesterone levels. So this means that seizure medications make our OCPs less effective and more likely to fail or to cause an unintended pregnancy. So in general, the, the estrogen in our OCPs uh, prevents ovulation and the progesterone thickens the cervical mucus and changes the lining of the uterus. Oral contraception can decrease the effectiveness of some seizure medications, so backwards. So our pill can actually make our seizure medications work less effectively and thus potentially increase our seizure frequency. 
So examples of this are lamotrigine and valproate. So here is just a list of our most common seizure medications and how they are uh, they interact with contraceptions. So seizure medications that decrease the effectiveness of oral contraceptive pills, so making the OCPs less effective. So anything in the carbamazepine family, so carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine, eslecarbazepine, lamotrigine at high doses, so anything over 300 milligrams a day, phenytoin and phenobarbital, topiramate at doses greater than 200 milligrams a day, clobazam, and then primidone, felbamate, rufinamide, and parampanil. So this is the red box, okay, ones that will decrease effectiveness of OCPs. And then in the green box over here, seizure medications that do not affect um, OCPs. So this is levetiracetam or Keppra, lamotrigine at lower doses, zanisamide, valproate, and then any of our benzodiazepines, so clonazepam, lorazepam, and diazepam, glucosamide, gabapentin, pregabalin, bigabitrin, and ethosuximide. So here's just a table again about what we talked about. And you can see that this top group was the ones that really don't, are not affected by hormonal contraception. And then everything down here do, uh, are effective. So contraceptive methods. So what can we use? So IUDs or intrauterine devices the copper or levonorgestrel are the best options, and both of these work very, very well. Avoid enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drugs. So enzyme-inducing include phenytoin, phenobarbital, carbamazepine. So avoid these types of anti-epileptic drugs if you're using combined oral contraceptive pills, the vaginal ring or transdermal patch. And if you're going to remain on an OCP, use a higher dose of estrogen, so at least 50 micrograms of estrogen. If you're going to use the Depo shot uh, or Depo Provera with any of these enzyme inducing uh, anti epileptic drugs that we talked about, we recommend that you inject it more frequently um, than healthy women. So instead of every 12 weeks, we recommend every 10 weeks. And then if you need to use the morning after pill, there is some evidence that you may need a higher dose if you are on an enzyme inducing anti epileptic drug. Just a special note about lamotrigine, or the brand name is Lamictal. So lamotrigine actually uh, decreases, the blood levels decrease by 50% when an oral contraceptive is used, meaning that your levels are half of what they would have been if you weren't on a pill. So if you are going to remain on an oral contraceptive pill, we recommend that you track your seizures very carefully. Um, your doctor will probably check your lamotrigine blood level, um, possibly at certain times of your menstrual cycle. And when birth control is stopped or started, um, that dose of the lamotrigine may need to be adjusted. All right, so here is just another table just to emphasize, um, you know, how good a uh, contraceptive method is. So here at the very top in this green box is the intrauterine device, the copper and the levonorgestrel releasing uh, intrauterine device. And you can see there's less than 1% of pregnancy per year, so very, very effective. In contrast, when you use any type of combined hormonal contraception, so either the oral contraceptive pills, the vaginal ring, transdermal patches, it increases to 9% of pregnancies, okay, 9%. All right. Um, in some place that, you know, if you are using birth control and you have epilepsy, you can always um, join this registry at epilepsybirthcontrolregistry.com. Okay, moving on to pregnancy. So pre-pregnancy planning, pregnancy, and breastfeeding. So before we start on this topic, I just want to emphasize that most women will have a straightforward pregnancy, delivery, and give birth to a very healthy baby. Um, nearly 1.5 million women of childbearing age in the U.S. live with epilepsy, and 24,000 women give birth each year. Women with epilepsy are just as likely to achieve pregnancy as those without, and there's no difference in the time to pregnancy or pregnancy outcomes in terms of miscarriages or live births between women with epilepsy and healthy women. So why are seizures during pregnancy an issue? So tonic-clonic seizures 
expose the fetus to anoxia um, or lack of oxygen and increase the risk of maternal injury. There have been uh, some studies that show that uterine contractions and fetal heart rate changes have uh, been demonstrated during focal seizures with loss of consciousness in the mom. And there is an increase in the risk of preterm labor and small for gestational age infants. There's also a 10 times increase in mortality of the mother during pregnancy in the postpartum period, mostly from what we call SUDEP or sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. Most women will have no change in their seizure frequency compared to prior, um, prior to pregnancy. A minority will have a decrease in seizures and less than a third will have an increase in seizure frequency. Seizure stability prior to pregnancy is one of the strongest predictors of seizure control during pregnancy, meaning that if you were doing well before you got pregnant, you will likely do well throughout your pregnancy as long as you stay on the same regimen and your doctor is following you closely with blood levels. Women who are seizure-free in the nine months prior to pregnancy have about a 90% chance of remaining seizure-free on the current regimen. So this is why it's so important to plan your pregnancies if you do have epilepsy. Um, so that your doctor can help kind of optimize that regimen for you. So when should we start counseling? So we start counseling at the very, very first visit that you um, present to an epilepsy specialist and with every subsequent visit. So over 30% of women with epilepsy do not use highly uh, effective contraception and 50% do not take folic acid. So the greatest risk of teratogenicity or having um, a baby with a major congenital malformation is during that first trimester. And almost all abnormalities are formed by eight to 10 weeks. And this is very, very early. So before many women know that they are pregnant. So when we think about taking care of women with epilepsy, preconception. So if it's over a year before they are planning on getting pregnant, then we potentially consider some medication changes if those medicines are related to, um, are considered high risk. So high risk medications include valproate or Depakote, topiramate or Topamax, phenobarbital, and phenytoin or Dilantin. So consider, we consider trials of seizure medication withdrawal if you've been seizure free for two to four years. We try our best to decrease our medication doses and um, we start drawing blood levels so that we know where um, your drug, your therapeutic drug levels sit. Folic acid is important in all women uh, with epilepsy and we make sure that everyone has adequate contraception. Now, if you are less than a year away from planning on becoming pregnant, then we only adjust seizure medications in cases where benefits clearly outweigh the risks so meaning that if, you're, if you would like to get pregnant within a year, most of your doctors will not change your seizure medications. Um, we recommend that you use contraception during medication adjustments. You will need to have your seizure medication blood levels checked several times so that we can establish a good level that we need to reach during pregnancy. And then you need to know that while you are pregnant, seizure medication levels will need to be checked at least every four weeks as they will change drastically during pregnancy. And this is especially pertinent for medications including lamotrigine, oxcarbazepine or trileptal, and levetiracetam or Keppra. Folic acid is very, very important and we recommend 0.4, so 0.4 uh, milligrams is the what is found in any of your prenatal vitamins all the way up to four milligrams a day. Plan for an anatomic ultrasound at 18 to 20 weeks. And then just know that right after you give birth, your medication dosages that have been slowly increased throughout your pregnancy will likely need to be rapidly dropped back to what you were at before you got pregnant as your hormone levels return to baseline. Sometimes, you know, you may need slightly higher doses in the first couple months postpartum since you will be pretty sleep deprived from your baby. 
So in general, the risk of major congenital malformations is about three times greater in women with epilepsy than in healthy women. So about 6% risk versus 2%. Um, being on multiple seizure medications at a time, so polytherapy that is more risky than being on a, a single therapy or single drug. And some drugs do have dose-dependent risk, meaning the higher the dose of the drug, the higher the risk of a congenital malformation. So those medications include valproate, carbamazepine, phenobarbital, and lamotrigine. So here is just a graph taken from uh, one of our um, review papers. And you can just see, so this is listing different seizure medications all on the left side. And then this is on the, um, on the bottom percentage of major congenital malformations. And you can see that valproic acid or Depakote is the highest risk at 9%. And then it slowly drops down. So phenobarbital is about 6%, topiramate at about 5% and then the rest at about 2 to 3%. So one note about valproate or Depakote. So this is one of those medicines that we do try to avoid if all possible uh, in women with childbearing age because it has that highest risk of congenital malformation, so about 9% risk. Risk does increase with higher doses and it has been associated with poor uh, outcomes in the baby. So uh, cognitive and psychomotor outcomes, language uh, and developmental delays. And so that's why we do try to um, avoid valproate in, in young women. Lamotrigine, so another word about lamotrigine. So lamotrigine or lamictal is uh, the metabolism is actually induced um, by the increase in estrogen during pregnancy. So the clearance increased by greater than 200% over the course of pregnancy, meaning that your uh, dosage of the lamotrigine will probably double or even uh, triple uh, throughout your pregnancy. And that's why it's so important for your doctor to be monitoring you very, very closely at least every four weeks so that that dosage can be increased. Right after you give birth, those dosages will likely need to be dropped right back down to what you were at before. Um, and just know that very high doses of the lamotrigine is not uncommon. Right. And then vitamin K. So vitamin K is given in our patients who take enzyme-inducing anti-epileptic drugs, so carbamazepine, phenytoin, phenobarbital, um, to prevent uh, intracranial uh, neonatal hemorrhage, so any brain bleeds in the baby in the third trimester. So postpartum, so there is an increased rate of depression and anxiety compared to women without epilepsy in the postpartum period. And this is more prevalent in those who have a history of anxiety and depression and have been and are treated with seizure medications. Despite this, however, it, um, studies do show that fewer women with epilepsy receive adequate treatment with antidepressants compared to women without epilepsy. So this is why it's very, very important for um, all of our patients to always talk to your doctors and seek medical advice when you do uh, feel postpartum depression or anxiety. Right. And then a word on breastfeeding. So in general, breastfeeding is um, always uh, advocated. So the benefits of breastfeeding are felt to outweigh the risks regardless of whatever seizure medication the mom is on. So there have been studies that show that infants exposed to various seizure medications still had a higher IQ and language scores compared to those children um, who were not breastfed um, and their mothers had epilepsy. Special considerations are for barbiturates and benzodiazepines, so any of these sedative medications, they could potentially um, make the baby a little bit sleepier as it is um, uh, seen in the breast milk, and, and that's something that you should talk to your doctor about. Moving on to mood disorders related to epilepsy. So depression is a comorbidity of epilepsy, meaning that those with epilepsy are inherently at higher risk of having depression. It just comes hand in hand. Comorbid mood disorders are often under-recognized and under-treated, and about a third of people with epilepsy have major, depress uh, major depression. And likely there's a higher percentage of people who do have depressed mood 
they don't quite meet the criteria for major depression, but they would still benefit from treatment. So it's very important um, that we always look for um, any type of mood disorders in our women uh, with epilepsy. Our hormones can also play a role in our mood, so fluctuations in our hormones during our menstrual cycle can also affect both seizures and mood. So things that can um, affect our mood. So the type of seizure, the type of epilepsy that you have is actually linked to um, being at a higher risk for depression. So the type of seizures, where your seizures are coming from in your brain, so temporal lobe seizures, the side that your seizure is coming from, so the left side versus the right side, and how frequent your seizures are. People actually can have a decrease in their mood for up to three days before a seizure actually happens, and then it takes up to three days after the seizure occurs for your mood to return back to baseline. And then post ictal depression occurs in about half of people lasting about a day. So seizures are definitely linking, uh, linked to your mood. Other, some types of seizure medications are known to affect your mood. So um, barbiturates, topiramate, bigabitrin, levetiracetam, and parampanil have been associated with mood changes. Zanisamide is associated with hypomania or psychosis in some individuals. And then other ones of our seizure medications, such as valproate or lamotrigine, are actually mood uh, stabilizing, so are often used by our psychiatrists as well. Things that can also uh, affect our mood, so just our psychosocial issues, so stressful life events, being a woman is a risk factor, uh, adjusting to life with epilepsy, um, ha the perceived stigma of epilepsy is a big thing, and being able to hold down a job if you have seizures. So people who have depression do have increased seizure uh, or have worsened seizure control. So more seizures um, are, not as less like, are not as likely to take their medications on time, uh, less likely to keep a job and using the um, hospital more frequently. So depression is something that I always ask about and try and make sure that they're treated appropriately. All right, last but not least, women's health and aging. So, Women with epilepsy have a two to six times higher risk of fractures due to altered bone metabolism, decreased bone density, and propensity to fall. So either from their seizures themselves or the side effects from their medicines. Risk factors for bone health and osteoporosis, just being a woman again, uh, being postmenopausal, being sedentary, smoking, alcohol, uh, not getting outside and having inadequate sun exposure, and enzyme-inducing AD, so again, phenytoin, phenobarbital, carbamazepine are also associated with a higher risk of osteoporosis. So if you do not have any evidence of decreased bone health, we recommend monitoring your vitamin D and calcium levels one, once or twice a year. Um, consider a vitamin D or calcium supplement, getting a bone scan about every two years, especially if you're postmenopausal and then encouraging exercise, smoking cessation, and limiting your alcohol. Now, if you do have evidence of bone loss, so osteopenia or osteoporosis, then you need to take higher levels of vitamin D and calcium. Um, your doctor may consider switching you to a lower risk seizure medication and consider treatment with bisphosphonates or estrogens and hormone therapy and potentially referring you to an uh, endocrine specialist. So a word again on valproate. So valproate has been associated with weight gain, obesity, and high cholesterol. And there's a higher risk of developing something that we call PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome if you're starting before the age of 20. And PCOS has been linked to um, difficulty with ovulation and infertility, um, and you have an increased risk of menstrual disorders. All right, sexual dysfunction. So something that nobody wants to talk about with their doctor. So epilepsy in itself has been associated with sexual dysfunction due to alteration in hormones and involvement of certain parts of the brain with, uh, because of the seizures. So over a third of women report pain with intercourse, vaginismus, and lack of vaginal lubrication. So some of our medications, like the enzyme-inducing medications, again, can decrease your libido. 
Um, but it's still important to have uh, good seizure control because that can in itself improve sexual function by reducing anxiety and improving quality of life. Menopause, all right, so women with epilepsy are susceptible to early perimenopause and menopause. And this may have, um, in these changes uh, in your hormones during menopause may lead to changes in your seizure frequency. Those with catamenial epilepsy may actually have an improvement in their seizures. And just know that hormone replacement therapy can actually worsen seizures. All right, so take home points. So embrace being a woman. Take care of your body, understand what makes us special. Seizures can worsen around the menstrual cycle. So keeping a seizure diary can help your doctor evaluate whether further treatments uh, may be helpful. Contraception, we talked a lot about contraception. It's important in all women uh, with epilepsy and childbearing age, and an IUD is the recommended method. If you want to get pregnant, start talking to your doctor as early as possible and know that while you're pregnant, there's, uh, your doctor will need to closely monitor your medications and seizures. Breastfeeding is in general uh, okay. Depression uh, is something that we always need to look out for and uh, we encourage our patients to talk to us. And then of course, don't forget about your bones. All right. So um, just remember, mark your calendars for next year. Uh, November 8th, 9th, and 10th is Epilepsy Awareness Day at Disneyland, and I'm happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Really appreciate it. What a thorough uh, presentation you just gave. We already have a couple of questions in the chat, so I will read them to you and try not to butcher Sure. Uh, some of the some of the words. So, anyways, uh, the first one came comes from Karen, and her question is: If there is a time, could Dr. Ma comment on taking OCP with higher progesterone straight for four months and then off a week to keep from having a monthly cycle and in turn more seizures? I'm wondering how it might be effective affecting ADs or seizures. If there's no time, no problem. Thanks, but. That was the so, question. Yeah, so um, that is a really, really good question. So again, progesterone is considered that anti-seizure um, uh, hormone. Um, you know, there, to be honest, there isn't that much information, and I, can, I, I should look at this myself, about taking higher progesterone levels um, in terms of oral contraceptive pills. I think that in general, we still advocate against taking OCPs if you're going to be on enzyme-inducing medications just because of the higher failure rate in general. Um, but you can see here on this slide that um, progesterone is a little bit lower in terms of if you do the depo shot um, or you take um, or you do implants. So this is the um, progesterone implant that you get in your arm. So that one's actually pretty effective. Um, the progesterone-only pills are, are really not great. Um, those are what we call the mini pills. Um, they require you to take them at a very, very specific time every day. And if you don't take them at exactly, say, 7 o'clock every day, then the failure rate is very high. Um, so those are not um, recommended. But, you know, I, I don't know if the effect or, or the, I guess, if having a higher progesterone level in your OCP actually decreases um, your your failure rate for OCPs. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Hopefully, Karen, that answered your question. The next question comes from Angie. Is there a way to manage weight gain from taking valproic acid? I took it for 10 years. I changed it to pyramid seven years ago, but I gained about 40 pounds within the last four years. Oh, that's a, that's a really good question. So valproate is a great seizure medication. It's one of our oldest seizure medications, but you know, women tend to really not like it just because of the side effects. The weight gain is often astronomical. You know, I have patients that gain, you know, 40, 60 pounds on Depakote, and it's very, very hard to lose. Um, you know, if you are switched to topiramate, then 
at least that in itself is related to weight loss. So topiramate and zinesamide are related to our um, associated with weight loss um, rather than weight gain. Um, but you know, if you're trying to lose the last couple pounds with the Valpro, then I think that would just um, rely on exercise and diet by, at this point. Um, hopefully the metabolism changes that, that caused you to have the weight gain when you were on the Valproate have reversed. Um, so it'll be easier to lose the weight now, but definitely, you know, if I see a patient starting to gain, you know, five, 10 pounds on Valproate, I try to change them if I can. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Um, the next question comes from Lindsay. Uh, what about Vimpad? Does that affect pregnancy? Does taking two seizure medications together put you at higher risk? So unfortunately, a lot of these newer medicines, so Vimpad or Lucosamide, um, Parampanol or Ficompa, Clobazam, all of these newer medications just don't have as much data on them because we haven't had that many, uh, that long of experience. Um, you know, there are all these registries out there that we're trying to gain um, more experience on the congenital malformations related to them. But in general, we do consider them on the higher risk side, just because we just don't have as much data. If you look at them, they're all going to be either pregnancy category C or higher um, for that. And so, and so Vimpat, is, I think, would be in that category. We just don't know too much about it. And then if you are on polytherapy or you're on two seizure medicines versus one that does uh, increase your risk. But, you know, as I said, most women, um, you know, have very uh, uncomplicated pregnancies, even if they do have epilepsy. And sometimes you do need to be on two or three seizure medications to keep you from having a seizure, uh, a big convulsion while you're pregnant, which may be riskier than just staying on um, the medicines that you're on. So it's just, you know, a tight balance that you need to discuss with your doctor. Thank you, Dr. Ma. Um, if anybody has any questions, we still have a few minutes with Dr. Ma um, and uh, we'll get to them. Um, Andrew just uh, made a little comment. I gained 60 pounds within the first six months when I started taking Valparada, could never lose them. Thank you for the answer. So she thanks you for your insight on that, Dr. Ma. Anybody have any more questions? Here we go. I got a question from Pam. My daughter is 40 and she suffers from catamenial epilepsy. Her sutures have increased since starting perimenopause. She does use a progesterone cream in addition to three seizure meds. How do you know if you should increase your progesterone? So I'm sorry, can you just tell me one more time she's perimenopausal? She's perimenopausal, yes. So let's see if I can uh, open this up for you guys. So um, progesterone, you know, in terms of trying to treat either perimenopausal or catamenial epilepsy, you know, the evidence just, it's not great, but I think that if you have this clear evidence of clustering around certain times of your cycle or, you know, as we're adjusting into menopause, then it's definitely worth a shot. You know, the dosage of um, progesterone is, is not great in terms of evidence, but if you can see here, so this is a list of kind of the, ad, uh, the treatments that people use for catamenal epilepsy, or, you know, we can kind of um, put this into perimenopause and menopause. So here is that um, progesterone um, block right here. So this bottom part. So medroxyprogesterone here. So they're thinking um, they say 10 milligrams two to four times a day or the depot shot um, every six to 12 weeks. Or you can try the lozenges. So it's 200 milligrams three times a day um, on days 14 to 25 and the 100 milligrams three times a day for the other days. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you can kind of push and pull in terms of trying different dosages of the progesterone. And if that's not helping, then trying other, uh, other types of treatments like the ones above is also possible. But a lot of the times, you know, I, I sometimes just have to increase whatever seizure medications they're on rather than trying these methods, which are 
which just don't have as much evidence going to them. Thank you, Dr. Ma, appreciate the answer. Um, we have another question. Do you recommend, and this is from Anne, do you recommend young adults on AED that may cause osteoporosis to take vitamin D and folic acid? So yes, so I think vitamin D and calcium just, uh, or just taking a, a multivitamin a day um, is often um, something that I would recommend. Um, taking a little extra vitamin D if you're on, you know, carbamazepine or thanatoin or something like that in those medication classes, I think is very, very reasonable. Um, you know, for my young women that I keep on enzyme inducing medications, I do start looking at their bone scans um, after they've been on seizure medications for a couple years, just to make sure that things are looking good. And if there is any evidence of bone loss, then we can get them on adequate treatment. And then folic acid, you know, I recommend folic acid in all of my um, pa women patients, you know, as long as they're not menopausal, um, because the rate of unintended pregnancies is so high in women with epilepsy, and folic acid is so benign, but it could potentially prevent a fetal malformation, I think it's, it's, it's totally worth it. Um, so, so the folic acid is a definite yes. Perfect. I think we got to our last question, Dr. Ma, if there's nobody else, um, or like I always say, going once, going twice. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody would like to uh, jump in and type a question in, otherwise, oh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Alyssa, for joining us. We just want to thank everybody. Um, Dr. Ma's contact information will be on our website, as well as um, any other resources that you might uh, need. So thank you so much for joining us uh, this morning on uh, Dr. Ma's presentation on women treating women. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan, I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.